Today, we welcome Conservative MP Andrew Rossendell aboard the Rocket. Born and brought up in Romford, where Essex meets Greater London, Rossendale's represented the constituency of his birth since winning the seat in 2001. A committed Brexiteer, he was among the 28 Tory MPs who originally rebelled against Theresa May's Brexit withdrawal agreement in 2019. And while having served on his party's front bench in opposition, as a shadow Home Office Minister under David Cameron, Rossendale's made his name largely as an influential and courageous backbench campaigner. Who better we thought to take the mood of the Parliamentary Party in the aftermath of last week's local and mayoral elections, widely seen as a disaster for Rishi Sunak? Is the Tory backbench plot to oust the Prime Minister before the general elections really over? Could it be rhetoric if Sunak fails to do what the rebels want, moving towards what they see as more traditional Conservative policies – on tax, immigration and defence. I started by asking Andrew Rossendell for his reaction to his party's local election performance. They're pretty disastrous, aren't they? It's really bad for the Conservative Party that we're now losing so much support from our core voters. And I think there's a lot of disappointment, there's dis disillusionment about the government, about the party. But I have to say, I think it's generally disillusionment about politics in this country. There's a feeling that not only that nothing works, but the people we vote for, the people we elect, don't really seem to have the power to do very much. Everything seems to be a process. Everything seems to be controlled by people we don't elect, civil servants and public bodies that seem to make their own decisions. And the actual people like myself, who stand for election, seem to have very little influence over what happens. And I think that's the root of our problem. And I think for the government to get back on track, we've got to show that we're in charge again. Andrew, what do you say to those in your party, your fellow Conservative parliamentarians, who think the answer to your party's electoral woes is to go in the direction that you would feel is less Conservative? Well, I think it's bonkers. Uh, I think the reason why we're losing uh, votes is because we were elected on a clear Conservative mandate with an 80-seat majority, and we appear, certainly in the eyes of a large numbers of the public, that we haven't actually delivered on the things we said we would do. We've, in fact, gone in a very different direction. Now, a lot of that is, I'm afraid, to do with the consequences of lockdowns. And I think we need to talk about this a bit more because I think the lockdowns did huge long-term damage to our country, to our economy, to the mindset of the British people. And we're suffering the consequences of that. And a lot of problems we're facing today are a throwback from that period when I think personally, foolishly, we locked down the country for uh, two years on and off. And I think there are consequences to pay for that. However, I actually think the period of the pandemic and the lockdowns could have been an opportunity for the government to actually reduce layers of government. For instance, a good example of that would have been the Greater London Authority. I think the mayor should have been stripped of his control over TfL. I don't think we should have allowed the Scottish and Welsh first ministers to have power. It should have been a UK-wide matter. So a lot of it, I'm afraid, dates back to the lockdowns. We're suffering from the consequences of that. But the party and the government has lost its radical edge. If we want to win the next election, we have to deserve it. And to deserve it, we've got to show we've got a vision for the country. And a vision for the country needs clear, strong leadership. And Rishi Sunak has a window of opportunity now to, to show that he understands what the country needs and to get on with the job. If he doesn't, I think we've got big problems coming down the road later in the autumn. You genuinely think that the UK's experience of lockdown, because so much of the public did give up freedoms, because we did become more status, because a lot of families were entirely reliant on government handouts, so-called furlough. Do you think that's made the country systematically less conservative? It's taken people's eye off the ball. I believe that Britain and any country, of course, can be strong and prosperous and successful, but it's down to the people themselves. Governments can't make the country successful. They can provide leadership, they can provide structure, they can provide sensible laws. Unfortunately, we've got into the mindset where the people are now just depending on the government to solve every problem and fix every issue. Equally so, 
we've spent huge sums of money. What does it, Liam? You know better than me. Four to five hundred billion we've borrowed to pay for the pandemic. Well, you know, that money wasn't free and it has to be paid back. And there are consequences to borrowing large sums of money. We now have huge, huge levels of taxation, which is deeply unconservative and clearly is not going to lead to a vibrant, competitive economic situation with such high levels of taxes. So we do need to get back to being a bit more radical to give people more freedom with responsibility. And that, I think, is what we're missing at the moment. We've got plenty of things that need doing, but the government can't do all of it. Reduce the size of government. There's too much government, too much interference, too much red tape in, and bureaucracy and quangos making decisions. It needs a 1979 moment. You know, that's what's required. 1979, Margaret Thatcher came in with a clear agenda for Britain, and it was tough. It was unpopular to start with. This is what Liz Trust tried to do to some extent. But ultimately, if you stick at that kind of plan for a country, you reap rewards down the road. And that's the kind of radical approach I believe my party needs to now adopt. You're a a small state kind of chap, Andrew. You're a very pro-enterprise MP. You want a competent state, but you don't like the idea that the tax burden is at a 70-year high tax as a share of our national income. What would you say to politicians, even journalists, broadcasters, who say that your views are not just centre-right, but a hard-right, a far-right? No, they're the absolute opposite of that. I think that I represent, in many of my views, I know people will brand me in that way, but it's completely wrong. I represent the common ground. I think that most people want to see small government. They don't like government interfering in their lives. Look at the latest thing the government tried to do at the moment, ban the smoking. I mean, we all want kids to not smoke. Of course we do. But banning things and taking away people's freedom is not the way to do it. So I think that we do need a small state. And I do think that most people don't like overbearing government, high taxes, bureaucracy and red tape. They do want to see their town halls and their government town halls and their government departments open for business and civil servants and local government officers back to work. They do want to see things returning to normal. But equally so, we need government to have a vision for this. Unfortunately, we're still bobbing along the bottom. We haven't quite got out of that lockdown mindset. And I think that in the next six months, and we only have maximum of six months left, well, I suppose we could go to January, but I would imagine it's going to be maximum of six months, the Conservative Party has a chance. It has a chance to show that we've got a vision for the country which will get Britain back on track. That is what's needed. I don't think Labour have any ideas that are better than ours. In fact, I think in many areas, they have no ideas at all. They have no concept of what needs to happen. It seems to me they want to be in government for the sake of being in government to kick us out so that they can be in instead. They don't really have a clear idea of what the country needs. I think the Conservative Party still has that ability. It still has that possibility that we can show strong leadership again, but we are running out of time. So let's cut to the chase, Andrew Rossendale. You're not just an observer in this debate. You're a player. You are one of the backbench MPs who could very easily hand in a letter to your friend, Sir Graham Brady. Maybe you even have. He only needs to receive 52 letters. Then we're in no confidence territory. And yet you're talking about Sunak having a window of opportunity. Is the plot to remove the Prime Minister before a general election resting, or is it over? Well, I'm not involved in any plot. I haven't sent a letter in to Sir Graham Brady, and I have been speaking to the Prime Minister. I've never actually put a letter in against any Prime Minister. You know, I'm very much committed to the party coming together and for us to win the next election unified. But look, we all know that there are times when changes have to happen in order to win. That happened five years ago when Theresa May stood down and Boris Johnson came in and things were turned around within five or six months. So I'm not saying that's going to happen again, but I do think Rishi needs to think long and hard about where we're going. You know, he has done everything he possibly can to get us into a better economic state. And it's very slow, but we are gradually getting into a better economic position. But is it going to be enough for us to win the election? He needs to think long and hard about where we're going. 
I think by the Whitson recess, we either need a very clear, strong agenda for Britain where the British people can actually think again and stop a left-wing Labour government from being elected, give them the opportunity to vote for something clear and positive, which is going to put the country back on track. And if Rishi isn't going to do that, then clearly, you know, the party and Rishi are going to have to think again. So I am confident that in the next few weeks, the party is going to come together and there's going to be a clear, clear new approach. We cannot go on as we are. We need to refresh the government. We need clear, strong, radical policies. He needs to bring people back who have been pushed out. You know, it's no good having a government of technocrats, government of administrators. We need a government with a strong conservative vision for Britain. The weather's getting better. The number of small boat crossings are likely to go up. Already so far this year on the latest numbers, there have been more crossings than in 2023. Andrew, do you think the UK needs to leave the ECHR in order effectively to tackle the small boats crisis? Or do you think we can do it from within the ECR framework, maybe with derogations or clauses that we can insert for our own domestic purposes? Because this really has become the litmus test for many Conservatives, hasn't it, of whether or not Rishi Sunak is serious about tackling this crisis? I doubt whether we can do that before the election. I think there's lots of things I'd like the party to adopt as policy to try to get them through before the election, but I don't think we can because within the parliamentary party, there wouldn't be a majority for it. But we have to be radical and we have to stop worrying about what everyone else is going to think about what we do. Start thinking about what's in the interests of Britain. And it's clearly in the interests of the United Kingdom that we are sovereign in our own land. Now, we left the European Union for that purpose, but we forgot about the ECHR, which now has far too much power, disproportionate power over what happens. Now, this is Labour's fault, of course. It was Tony Blair that brought in the Human Rights Act, which embedded the ECHR into British law. Before that, it was purely advisory. We've also got the Supreme Court. So we need a radical plan to change all this. And getting out of the ECHR, I now think, is unavoidable. It's not impossible, but I don't think it's likely. I think we haven't made that commitment. So I think from a democratic point of view, it should be in our manifesto. And if the manifesto has got to include lots of radical new ideas for the country. And if we do that, we're going to give the people a clear choice. At the moment, it's which centrist, slightly left of centre, slightly right of centre, do we have Keir or Rishi? You know, there needs to be clear divide, a clear choice the British people have to make at the next election. At the moment, it's not clear enough. At home over the weekend, I was watching the Sunday morning political chat shows, as you do if you're a political obsessive like you and me. But I was struck by the number of commentators who said that the public don't really care about immigration, that it's a Tory obsession. It's all about the party turning in on itself. What do you say to that? I think they're completely out of touch with what the average man and woman thinks in this country. It's, look, London seems to be in a very different place than the bulk of the rest of the country. I'm an Essex MP, although I'm, unfortunately we're stuck in Greater London. We'd love to be free of that and be in an autonomous borough, but we're stuck under the Mayor of London. And I know better than most MPs in the Greater London area that my constituents in Romford think very differently than the perceived opinion in in a London. And I just think that people that think that immigration isn't a problem are just so out of touch. We have had colossal increase of immigration in the last 15 years. Every government has promised to tackle immigration, both legal and illegal, but we failed to do it. Every single time we promised, and every single time it hasn't happened, people no longer believe us. But we have to control our population and control the immigration into this country. If we don't, we're talking about in the next, I think, next eight or 10 years, an increase in population the size of Scotland coming in. It's simply unsustainable. And I think that it's also leading to divisions in our society. It's creating cultural divisions. It's feeding into the woke agenda. When people dislike our country and hate our country, use immigration, they weaponize it as a way of dividing us even further. What we need to do is have immigration together with integration. If you integrate and you're part of British society, immigration works. If you divide people up, 
then it doesn't work. You, you're, you're setting one group against another, which is what's happening, I'm afraid, in parts of London and in inner city areas in different parts of the country. So we need a firm, strong immigration policy, which we actually implement. It's no good promising these things and then failing to do it. And that is one of the major reasons why so many of our core voters are disillusioned with the Conservative Party and are voting for reform. If we want to actually prevent that from happening, we need an immigration policy which is right for our country, and that means controlling the numbers. You came into Parliament as MP for Romford in the heyday of Tony Blair, 2001, his second landslide election victory. What do you think of where Labour currently are, Andrew? Obviously, you're going to be campaigning strongly for a Conservative government, but when you talk to people on the doorsteps about the dangers of voting for Labour, what will be your main themes? I'm very worried. I think people are sleepwalking into allowing the most left-wing Labour government in history the opportunity to seize power. And goodness knows what damage they would do. I mean, Blair's government did enough damage. We've left with a legacy of so many things that he established, such as the Equalities Act, the constitutional reforms he brought in, and, and so on. Labour under Keir Starmer would be the most left-wing government. The core ministers are hiding away. They're keeping quiet, but they're still there. And I believe that a Labour government would do huge damage to our country. And I think the British people need to wake up. We need to prevent the calamity of a left-wing Labour government taking power from happening. They could be in power for 10 years. I weep in thinking the kind of things they would do. It's the opposite of what I think most British people want. People actually want a right of centre government that looks after the interests of our country, that re-energises the economy, controls the immigration, makes the most of the Brexit opportunities that we have so that we become a strong, prosperous, free nation again. These are the kind of basic things that I think people just are crying out for. The Conservative Party, by not delivering it, by not offering it, people are disillusioned. So a divided right, people voting for reform, but you're simply delivering a Labour government and, and one that could do huge damage to our country. So I think there needs to be discussions between Nigel Farage and the Conservative Party. I don't think that it would be a very proud legacy for Nigel, who I greatly admire. A lot of people in reform, most of whom are ex-Conservatives, if they hand over power to the most left-wing Labour government in history. I think they too need to rethink their strategy. And I think the Conservative Party needs to rethink our strategy. We've got six months to unite the right, have a clear, strong agenda for Britain and prevent the calamity of a left-wing Labour government. That's what I'd like to see happen. Andrew Rossendale, thanks so much for appearing on Planet Normal. Thank you. There you go, Alison. Andrew Rossendale there, a man who knows the Tory backbenches literally like the back of his own hand. He reckons the results were shocking last week, but for now, Sunak's safe. I should say, I think he's an absolutely perfect planet normal guy, really. So much of what he said resonated with me. That's my kind of MP. And I think something you put to him, Liam, was that someone like that, given the state of the Tory party, is sort of somehow depicted as a kind of extremist or far right. And we're hearing a lot of voices, not like Andrew's, essentially say, oh, we mustn't swivel too far to the right because that would be dangerous. But my case, which Andrew articulates very well, is what's happened is the Tory party has swung so far to the left that what Reform Party voters and others who are staying home are asking for is just, could you budge up a bit towards the centre-right? And I also really appreciated Andrew speaking with such rare honesty. You don't often hear this from the political class about the long-term damage of lockdown and how basically lockdown has buggered up so much that people are finding frustrating and infuriating about the Tory government. Indeed, Andrew Rossendale was one of the key anti-lockdown campaigners in Parliament. We, of course, talked a great deal, didn't we, Alison, during lockdown about the work of the COVID recovery group led by Mark Harper, who is now, of course, <laughs> in the cabinet running the transport brief. It seems to me that Andrew Rossendale and some of the rest of us, for that matter, won't get any credit as the various warnings we gave against lockdown become more and more true in terms of the damage 
to people's health, the extension of NHS waiting lists because the NHS was basically shut down during lockdown unless it was tackling COVID. The fact that mental health issues, worklessness have exploded really as big social phenomenon now in the UK since lockdown. Uh, you wrote a piece, didn't you, in The Telegraph, and mm. put the link in the show notes to this episode, because people like you and me who were anti-lockdown, we didn't discourage people from being vaccinated. We both had the vaccines ourselves, didn't we? And we said so on Planet Normal many times. But because we were brave enough to tackle the fierce pro-lockdown consensus with, of course, the government introducing lockdown and the Labour Party, the SNP and so on, calling for you know, ever more restrictions to be applied. We were talking about the dangers and we didn't get any thanks for it and we don't get any thanks now. Thinking what my grandmother used to say, you'll have your reward in heaven. That's how long we'll have to wait. Yeah, I wrote this piece, Liam, about, you know, I'm not a COVID conspiracy theorist. I was right. And the reason I wrote that was because I was really pretty annoyed Because a Times journalist called Janice Turner, she's an excellent journalist, but she wrote a piece where she mentioned, in fact, she was mentioning in a rather flattering way, my first novel. I don't know how she does it about working mothers. And Janice basically said, oh, Alison used to be great until she swerved into COVID conspiracy theories. And this was about three weeks ago. And I literally thought, are you still, are you still with everything we can see around us? Are you still going to call me? A conspiracy theorist, because God knows every single day or, you know, every other week now brings some confirmation that stuff that we were accused of being mad and wrongheaded and murderer, I think at some point was uh, one of the accusations. I've had it with that now, really. I mean, we've seen great people like Professor Shanetra Gupta, probably our greatest epidemiologist, world-renowned expert in coronaviruses, who said that the old and the vulnerable must be protected while everyone else got on with their lives. And she was accused of wanting hundreds of thousands of needless deaths. But now, of course, we know that with the excess deaths, we're getting tens of thousands of needless deaths because of the lockdown. So yeah, I mean, we'll put it in the show notes, but it's worth having a look at. And we should just also mention that this week, AstraZeneca has announced that its COVID vaccine is being withdrawn worldwide. And that follows the pharmaceutical company admitting in court that the jabs have caused various clotting disasters, including obviously terrible side effects and indeed, sadly, death. With any compensation payments indemnified by taxpayers. So what I did in my piece is I went through the various conspiracy theories uh, of which I was accused and then I contrasted them with the reality and it just gives you a kind of grim satisfaction. But I just won't, I won't take it anymore because I think at the time we were just had to sort of take the blows and everything we were accused of. I I don't mind that. That was the price that we had to pay for being in that particular trench and fighting that battle. But for people who did nothing, who literally did nothing while dads weren't allowed into the births of their own baby, (laughs) absolutely horrendous cruelty and stupidity. And nobody said anything. You know, so few journalists said that really can't be right. So we'll always be proud, won't we, co-pilot, that, you know, we stood up against the insanity, really. 